The price to build a new gaming PC nowadays is absolutely insane. So a lot of people are delaying their inevitable upgrades because, well, nowadays you don't really need to upgrade as often as in the past. I personally rocked DDR3 memory all the way from 2014 to 2020, going from an FX6300 to an i5-4690 with my still rock solid R9-280. But since then, not only has DDR4 been released, but DDR5 somewhat recently came out as well, meaning DDR3 memory is two generations old and seemingly completely dead and not really supported as much anymore. But as my cousin who is now in prison says, just because it's dead doesn't mean it's useless. I really need to stop taking advice from family. So let's see if it's still worth it to build a DDR3 PC nowadays, or if it's finally time to move on to DDR4 and leave Haswell and Bulldozer in the past for our future budget builds. For these builds, I didn't want to go with the highest end CPUs because frankly, they make no sense to buy. They're really expensive and don't perform much better than the slightly less powerful chips of the time, not to mention they're just power hogs too. I also went with Xeons on the Intel side because they just make more sense for a budget build, frankly. I mean, a 4790K is almost $100. What, what's up with that? I also want to test the viability of older DDR3 systems, not just in a performance sense, but also a budget wise. So with that out of the way, actually putting together budget DDR3 PCs these days is, Actually, it's starting to get not challenging, but not as easy as it used to be, mainly because the motherboards are dying left and right and they're starting to get pretty expensive, while the CPUs are still really cheap for the most part, besides at least the high-end FX and Extreme Edition CPUs. I am somewhat lucky though, because I do have my old AM3 system lying around still, and my old LGA 1150 motherboard, which covers the normal consumer end of the spectrum for DDR3 at the time. But around this time, there was also something else. There was X79 or LGA 2011, which was a pretty popular enthusiast platform for video editors or YouTubers at the time who didn't get paid enough for a sick gaming rig, so they used the mountains of free X79 boards they were given for unboxings to build personal gaming rigs. Dark times for YouTubers. Also servers and enterprise and stuff. Either way, getting an LGA 2011 board for a decent price is pretty prohibitively expensive for a budget build. A lot of the ones I looked at used were in the $100 price range just for the motherboard, which is about two times the cost of the CPU I want. I mean, Jesus. They're also really similarly priced to LGA 2011 three boards or X99, which are much better. Because of this, I would have to spend the entire budget for the base systems minus GPU just on the motherboard alone, which is just not acceptable. There is a way to get around the high cost of older DDR3 based systems though. And that is just buying an old pre-built workstation like this HP Z420. I got for just over a hundred dollars with everything needed to get started besides the CPU. Came with the pretty bog standard 500 watt power supply, 32 gigs of ECC DDR3 memory, and of course an LGA 2011 socket for my CPU. And for the CPU, I got myself a Xeon E5 1660V2 for about thirty dollars, which seems to be about the Xeon equivalent to the 4960X. I wanted a proper 4960X, but those are over a hundred dollars for some unholy reason. Seriously. Stop buying these for this price if you are the one doing this. This is ridiculous. Now, for my LGA 1150 board. This test bench consists of an EVGA 850 watt power supply, which is getting switched to another one for B-roll, just ignore it. A Xeon 1246V3, because what I have, and seems to be about the performance of a 4790, along with 16 gigabytes of bog standard HyperX DDR3 memory. Along with an ASRock X79 anniversary, I use to pair with an i5 4690 non-K and 4790 non-k back in the day never said i was smart i just let's move it on for my am3 platform i wanted to use an 8350 to try and use a cpu that was not quite the highest end but not too low end something like the other cpus i picked for my testing but it appears when i sold my fx8120 i sent them my 8350 so i haven't heard back from them and i don't want to spend 80 dollars on a terrible cpu i never use again so 8120 it is I'm also rocking the same 16 gigabytes of HyperX DDR3 memory for both the LJ1150 and AM3 systems. The HP though only uses ECC memory, so I'll just be using 32 gigs that I got with that. I was going to throw two 8 gig DIMMs in there, but nothing appeared to use more than 16 gigs anyways, and I'm also cheap. Fight me on my Discord I made. It's basically empty right now, and I have no idea how to run a Discord, so come and watch disaster unfold if that's what you're into. This is also where the Minecraft server will be announced. So many announcements. Wow. Subscribe. I also have COVID. Announcements! <coughs> so all in all, we have three, they're about $100 to $150 PCs, one AM3 one, one LGA1150, and one LGA2011 build, 
with CPUs that are all in the kind of somewhat mid to high end range for those sockets. At least the ones seem best suited for the budget and testing at hand. The GPU I'll be using is the Radeon RX 6600 because of its low power draw, 200-ish dollar price point, and well, because honestly, if you're running DDR3, the chances you're also running a brand new high-end GPU are pretty slim. If this GPU gets throttled in anything except the HP Z420 with the Xeon 1660, I will be absolutely genuinely shocked since I am going to be testing quite a few, actually mostly modern games. And one last thing. The LGA 1150 and AM3 systems will be on an open test bench, and some people were unhappy with my AM3 cooling setup. So is this enough fans for you, huh? Look at that. Look at those temps. Ice cold. Finally, we can get into the testing. Normally I go over basic use case stuff like internet browsing, whatever, but all three of these systems can easily handle any basic tasks and can pretty easily play back videos and all that good stuff. It's not that important for these. And from here on out, I'm going to refer to each CPU by their socket type to avoid any confusion between the Xeons. So my FX8120 has an AM3 socket, my 6 core Xeon E5 1660v2 is my LGA2011 chip, and my Xeon 1246v3 is the Haswell LGA1150 chip. So there we go. What I really want to see is gaming, so let's just get to it. Starting out with what I believe is the most demanding game, Red Dead Redemption 2. Starting out with LGA 1150, with that, Red Dead Redemption 2 in the benchmark got an average of 70.5 FPS in the benchmark with minimal stuttering and is absolutely playable. This is with quality settings, 1080p, no DLSS. LGA 2011 got an average of 69 FPS in the benchmark, same settings, which is very similar to the LGA 1150 build actually. And now our poor AM3 build with the FX8120. It got an average FPS of 47 with a 19 FPS minimum. Interestingly, though, sometimes the GPU was maxed out, sometimes the CPU was, so we weren't always running with the GPU pegged, but we definitely were for a decent amount of time. And then, of course, Doomer Eternal with LGA 1150, ray tracing on high 1080p, we got 9220 FPS with the GPU being the main bottleneck. With our 6-core LGA 2011 system, we got 100 to 130 FPS using most of the cores, but the CPU was not maxed out and the GPU was. For AM3, we got 80 to 100 FPS depending on the area and the enemies, and an overall pretty smooth actually experience which wasn't too bad. For Halo Infinite Disappointment, high settings, 1080p, no ray tracing, our 4-core LGA 1150 system got 90 to 100 FPS, little stuttering, pretty good experience. Our 6-core LGA 2011 build got a consistent 100 FPS, no CPU bottleneck, just GPU all the way through. And our poor AM3 system got mid 80s through 90 FPS, and it was consistent with pretty minimal stuttering. For Grand Theft, Too Many Kids Childhoods 5, I lost the footage for that right now, so that will just be on the screen because I am sick and I really cannot do any more work than I am currently doing. I am dying. Thank you. Moving on to my least favorite game in the world, CSGO, high settings, 1080p. Our four core LGA1150 setup was sitting in the mid 100 FPS, sometimes getting a taste of the low 200 FPS life, which wasn't too bad. LGA2011 system got 150 to 200 FPS, high settings, 1080p. And what, man, what the hell, even bots camp, God damn. And of course, our AM3 system, 60 to 100 FPS with some decent stuttering and pretty wild FPS. FPS. It was pretty all over the place. Not my favorite experience, but you could do it if that's what you want. Beam and G with medium settings preset 1080p on Italy Crossroads. With our 4 core LJ1150 setup, we got 80 through 95 FPS, which was really consistent and it was a very good experience with minimal stuttering, if any. If you went to a more densely populated area, your FPS would drop, but it was still pretty stable and playable. For LGA 2011, we got 80 to 100 FPS, and the extra cores didn't really seem to help very much, with only one vehicle on the screen though, although when I did spawn more vehicles, it used almost all of the cores, which was nice. Overall, very smooth experience. And for our poor AM3 build, it got 45 to 60 FPS with not a ton of stuttering, surprisingly a pretty good experience. And of course, Minecraft. I did 1.20.1 with a 12 chunk render distance and simulation distance, 1080p, all regular options turned on. For that, our quad core LGA 1150 got mid hundreds to low 200 FPS, minimal stuttering unless generating new chunks. It's not my favorite way to play Minecraft since I really hate the stuttering, especially when exploring new chunks, but it is playable. I'll give it that. For my LGA 2011 system with the 6 core Xeon, that got in the mid 200 to 300 FPS, and it was a very consistent and really nice and smooth experience, not too bad. And for our poor AM3 build, we got 100 to 130 FPS with lots of stuttering on new chunk gen. It was a meh experience, but it was still very playable. I'll give it that. Honestly, the gaming results really surprised me with this setup. All three of these systems could be great gaming machines. I don't think I would personally spring for the FX8120, mostly just due to the cost and worse performance. It just seems like a bad deal if you're building it 
purely from scratch, but in most games, the LGA 2011 and LGA 1150 systems were actually maxing out the GPU. Sure, that wasn't always the case, but I mean, the GPU costs almost twice as much as the entire system for some of these, and it's still the bottleneck. That's some good stuff. But I mean, hey, gaming's easy, all right? What about a little productivity? Are these old DDR3 systems still capable of being workhorses? Let's find out, and we'll start with my test Premiere timeline from my 5D classic video with animations removed. So this is a Premiere 2023 4K timeline with my Canon 5D video. The LGA 1150 was actually a pretty shockingly smooth scrubbing and playback experience. It's not ideal for me, but I would take it. And I did for quite a while before I upgraded to AM4. I used a 4790 for, I think, two years editing uh, videos for this channel, so not too bad. And to export the video, it took just slightly over 12 minutes, which isn't really horrible. It's almost one to one. For my six core LGA 2011 system, I was expecting a lot out of this, and I did get a decent amount out of it. I had smooth playback and pretty decent scrubbing too. It was a better experience in the four core LGA 1150 system, although it did take just over 17 minutes to export the video, which was weird. Although I didn't realize this at the time, but the slower export time may have been due to this PC using a different SSD from the LGA 1150 and AM3 system. I would have gone back and changed that, but I am sick. AM3 works with patience. It's not very smooth scrubbing scrubbing, but it can play back if you're patient. I would not want to edit video off this system without some low quality proxies. I am picky, but this kind of blows. Although I did edit video for multiple years with my FX6300 back in the day, but that was just regular 1080p video. So I don't know. It also took a whole 23 minutes and 30 seconds to export this really short 4K video, which is, that is quite a long time for me personally. That is too long. I don't like that. Either way though, you can edit video on all of these chips. Not too bad. I really would prefer the LGA 2011. 11 uh, chip with an M.2 SSD thrown in there. This does not support M.2 SSDs, so I don't know why I said that. Either way, Cinnamon Char 23. For Cinnamon Char 23, our four core LGA 1150 system got a score of 4011, which honestly isn't too bad for such an old chip. My LGA 2011 build got a 5464, and it only reached a max temperature of 64 degrees Celsius with the stock cooling solution, and it got a decently better score. Not as much as nowadays, but you gotta remember, these are old chips. We didn't have like doubling of performance every few years back in the day. And for AM3, our poor 8120 got a score of 2335, almost half of the LGA 1150 system. Pretty disappointing, but at least the CPU did stay cool at the very least. Honestly, I really thought this is where the 8120 was going to shine because of the eight supposed cores that AMD put on it. I don't know about anyone else, but these results really were surprising to me. I have built DDR3 systems pretty recently, but never with a GPU that's still considered decent by modern day standards. I mean, the last GPU I threw in a DDR3 system was a Fury X, and I mean, those weren't, those weren't the best. <laughs> Unless you're really video editing, doing 3D animation, or any other tasks that require a lot of cores, honestly, an LGA 1150 system with a 4770K, 4790, or a Xeon E5, 1246 V3 is still a pretty good deal with good performance. There are a couple problems with that though. One of those being your upgrade path is basically nil. It does not exist if you want to do a DDR3 build like this. And the remaining life of the parts is... I'm not really sure about that. I recently actually had my first ever CPU die on me and I've had a lot of CPUs and it was a Haswell Xeon. It was actually in this board just chilling out waiting for me to do a video on it. And I mean, I've had countless used DDR3 6 of RAM die on me and I've had plenty of DDR3 motherboards die on me. They're just, they're, they're just getting old, but I have never had a CPU die on me, which is concerning. By comparison though, the HP Z420 is similarly priced with more robust components because they are enterprise and a much better upgrade path since you can work your way all the way up to something like a Xeon E5 2697V2, which has 12 cores and 24 threads. Or if you can swing it, an HP Z440 will have a more modern socket with an even better upgrade path up to I think 26 cores or 28 cores, even if it is going to be limiting for your GPU. And in terms of AM3, I just... I think it's still not a great system to invest into if you're building a new PC. And if you want to hear why, check out my dedicated video on AM3 if you're interested. I really don't have much more to say about it. Either way, DDR3 is not dead yet. And if you don't have the money or need to upgrade to DDR4, DDR3 still works fine. All the CPUs still work fine. Although, this does make me wonder about DDR2 though. Subscribe for that.